In today's podcast, we're going to talk about the power of roughhousing and how helpful it can be to your kids' development. I, I think it's crucial as you're raising the kids to implement this soon. Welcome to the Art of Raising Humans. Hello and welcome to episode 80 of the Art of Raising Humans. I'm Kyle. And I'm Sarah. And summertime's coming to an end. It is. Right? I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah. This podcast should be uh -huh. dropping near the first week of August. Uh -huh. So for many people listening, school will be starting up. I'm sure, like us, you're yeah. getting all your gear together mm -hmm. and, and preparing and getting ready for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know last year, if parents are interested, we did a whole two-part series about going back to school and how to prepare your kid for that. So mm -hmm. in thinking about what we wanted to talk about uh, going into this school year, I was thinking about the same way of kind of helping prepare families for school, but I thought we, we kind of already did that. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to hit something that I think comes up time and time again in session or we're talking to families or even that we're experiencing ourselves throughout the summer. And one of those things that I think is really helpful that a lot of parents don't, don't maybe put a lot of time into thinking is, is rough housing. I know this one's actually kind of fun today to me because it's, it's so focused, but it's so just wild rough housing <laughs> yeah well and what made me think about it sarah is summertime means a lot of swimming for us so we have yeah. a, a local neighborhood swimming pool and the kids love to go swimming and the kids definitely swim a little different with you than they do with me yeah. um, i've noticed that with you is there a lot of rough housing that goes on no they probably like it but yeah that's so foreign to me yeah yeah so it's not something they do with you when we uh -huh. go i almost have to say hey we're not wrestling in the pool because <laughs> they want to be jumping on me, teaming up against me. Uh -huh. Typically, Abby, our oldest, and Brennan in the middle, they'll team up and want to battle me and try to chase me across the pool, maybe even get out, out of the pool, jump towards me, where Ellie, the youngest, she'll team up with me and she'll use uh -huh. her feet to splash them and try to keep them off of me. But I mean, this can go on for quite some time. And so yeah. as I was thinking about what we wanted to talk about in this podcast, man, we had a, a issue just a few days ago where I lost my cool and I got kind of upset and I, I got probably more angry than I have in a while. And it was mm -hmm. over something really stupid, <laughs> but um, it, I'll give you a hint. It had to do with a cookie and a dog eating that cookie. <laughs> and I really wanted that cookie. And somehow I was blaming the kids for the fact they gave them that cookie instead of the bone I intended for the dog. But anyway. So long story short, small hint. <laughs> yes, there was there was some anger expressed, <laughs> and even though there was some great healing afterwards, even though we did follow up and there's mm -hmm. some great connection after this angry outburst on my part, when we went swimming the next day, I felt like there was a lot more wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I felt like the kids really wanted to <laughs> beat the snot. <laughs> And, and in, in a fun way, you know, yeah, in a fun yeah, way. Yeah. So, so I think they really wanted to somehow, you know, and I even came back and kind of joked with you where I, I said, man, I thought we'd resolved the issue. I know. Maybe a few things were still kind of repressed in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, so I think the kids saw the swimming as a way to like attack me and get all yeah. those. But yeah. that's why I want to talk about roughhousing because it was such a healthy way to do it. I mean, yes. you know, the kids felt much better afterwards and nobody got hurt. I, I bet yeah. there was some frustration they had towards me getting expressed in that moment. And it doesn't even, real quick, doesn't even have to be at you. Yeah, yeah, of course. I yeah. mean, anytime a kid has a full backpack or mm -hmm. a, lo a load of emotions that they haven't been able to express from from a day at school, speaking of school, mm -hmm. or maybe they've been at grandma's house or a friend's house or whatever it might be, camp, they come back with things that they behaved or they managed or they got through, but all those feelings they didn't have anyone to talk to or any way to express get stored in their bodies. Yeah. And it's fantastic to get those feelings out because we don't want them stored in the body. We want to process through those. And roughhousing is such a great way to do that. Yeah. And I know, Sarah, a lot of kids I'm helping right now as they're thinking about school, a lot of the parents are kind of nervous about how the school year is going to go. And the mm -hmm. kids are equally as nervous. Some of them haven't had good experiences at school. So mm -hmm. I was thinking this would be such a great thing to implement a week before school starts or a few days before school starts is for mom or dad to intentionally do some roughhousing to yeah. kind of get some of those feelings out. So Today, we're going to be pulling upon um, some really great information from a book by Dr. Cohen and Anthony De 
Benedict, Benedict. <laughs> can't totally know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I know Dr. Cohen is correct because <laughs> I've read lots of Dr. Cohen's books, but it's called The Art of Roughhousing. And so it's a really great tool that I think you could seek out before the school year starts, maybe read, but we're going to try to hit upon the nine specific ways that roughhousing can benefit your kids. So hopefully inspires you to start this before school starts and even as school starts, because I bet there'll be a lot of anxiety and nervousness and you know, all types of feelings coming from that new school you're starting um, for you to really help them work that out with mm-hmm. you, you know, it'd mm-hmm. be a great way. Um, I, I'm, I'm even thinking, I remember one time with Brennan and I, when he was really little, we were at the library and I'd left him for a minute, Sarah, and Abby and I were looking at some books for her and he was over there playing with some kids at the library. And then um, he came over in tears and apparently something negative had happened between him and another kid, a kid had pushed him or something. And you could tell that he felt like his backpack was definitely full. Yeah. And so when I came home, I purposely engaged in some rough housing Mm -hmm. you saw those feelings kind of get less but then later on the day as he still seemed a little bit on edge i said hey let's do some more of that so we did some more rough housing and it seemed Mm -hmm. to finally help him work out some Mm -hmm. of that anxiety or fear or whatever it was Mm -hmm. he felt and he was then better able to communicate what had really happened between him and this kid because i think it was really confusing him why this kid had been so mean to him why this kid had pushed him for seemingly no reason at all and so i I think he was confused by that so the rough housing helped him be able to to express that yeah Yeah. but before we get into these well just on that point i love how you bring up the fact that sometimes we have to remember that kids don't always have the words. Mm -hmm. So it's stored inside of them. And we may even ask, what's wrong? What happened? And they really can't. We think, come on, just come on, just put put it out there. But they can't. It gets stuck in their body and, and they don't know how to put words to it, especially when they're young. But even as they get older, even when they have great language skills, we have to remember that sometimes they can't match up what happened, what they're feeling in their body with words to express Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to give them, you know, we did that podcast recently about play and the importance of play. And this sort of tag teams onto that. Mm -hmm. And that play gives kids a way to have language for what's going on inside of them, what they need, what they want, what they can't express. And roughhousing is is just kind of slides into that category, too. Of It's just amazing how it gives them language where they can't find it. Yeah. And so um, before we jump into those nine specific ways that will benefit your kid through roughhousing, I want to make sure that you, if you are liking the content, please like this podcast, please share it, comment on it, tell your friends about it. Sarah and I are also ramping up our speaking schedule coming up in fall 2023, spring 2024. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, I'd love for them to speak at my local school or I'd love for them to speak at my church or I have a small group of parents that we'd love to have you come to do that. We have courses we could also help you with as well. So all those, we just try to provide as many pathways for you to get the help you need as possible. Reach out to us at uh, through the website, which is parentinglegacy.com. You can go there and you can email us there, but there's a lot of ways to connect with us, but we just appreciate your support. And I want to make sure that we we emphasize that even though in this uh, podcast, Sarah, a lot of times we'll be talking about how I roughhouse with them because that's typically more how we roll in our house, right? Yeah. I do do more of the roughhousing and you do a much better job than I do about the nurturing and empathy and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so we realize both of us add something unique to that, but I don't want to limit that discussion to just dads are the only ones who roughhouse. You know, yeah. I think there are some moms I've met who do a great job roughhousing and some dads who do a great job nurturing and empathizing, right? Yeah. So it isn't just specifically along gender roles, but I may be sharing it with that kind of emphasis just because that's how we work. Well, and I think I did more roughhousing when they were little. Mm-hmm. It does feel different to me. And then there wasn't much roughhousing in my family mm-hmm. either. So it mm-hmm. feels a little a little different. I work out. And and I think also roughhousing, you say roughhousing, but that can include pillow fights. Yes, of course. It can yeah. include, um, I do this funny thing where I don't really roughhouse, but yet we get that physical where I'll kind of like trap the kids, like mm, I'm hugging them, yeah, you know, yeah, and I say, oh, right. you can't get away. Mm. You know, I love you. I'm just yeah. going to keep you forever. And it's yeah, like yeah, this yeah. joke we have. Yeah. And so they're trying to get away, but I'm yeah. constantly capturing them. Mm-hmm. And so that's right now roughhousing would look like that with me, but ve- look very different with you. So roughhousing yeah. can look a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and, and I want to point out this quote here, Sarah, that, that comes from that book where Dr. Cohen is claiming that roughhousing um, makes kids smart, emotionally intelligent, lovable and likable, ethical, physically fit, and joyful. 
Those seems to be some really great outcomes, yeah, right? And, really great. And, 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 and Let's that, all run out and rough house. And as I read that, like like you said, when you were looking over this info, it just gives words to something we already felt. You know? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking when you know we homeschool the kids, and there was a there was days where the kids, especially Abby, had a really hard time transitioning from when they when they were little from playing in the morning to then doing school. Mm -hmm. And I remember being very frustrated by that lack of ability to transition. And finally, when I realized, wait, it's just, they're just having a hard time doing that. They're just anxious about going from having fun, doing what they want to then doing this more structured, structured type thing. Yeah. And so that's when I started trying to tap into, I, there was a specific song I loved from the movie Tron Legacy. And uh, I turned on that, that music and um, was able then to turn that up really loud. And uh, we would, the music was about three and a half minutes long. And I told the kids, this three and a half minutes is about getting all that out, you know? And so that was just another way we'd wrestle. And then after the three and a half minutes, we'd stop the music, lay down, take a deep breath. And then they were better able to transition to mm -hmm. doing the schoolwork. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so that's where I first started kind of experiencing how roughhousing wasn't just me just playing with them, mm -hmm. but it was actually a tool I was using to help them manage their own anxiety or feelings. I remember a, a long time ago now, but I was reading about, they've done studies on the importance of dads in kids' mm -hmm. lives, which, you know, because we have this whole, we do have this thing where sometimes dads can be more absent or not participate as much because mm -hmm. they feel like, well, the mom needs to take care of the kids. Especially and, when they're younger. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. and I feel like that is largely, I, mean, I think as a society, we're moving away from that, but mm -hmm. there still can be feel that those feelings and you see that happening in families. But I remember, so I was reading about the importance of dads. They did say that they noticed that in the study, how much dads seem to bring that to the table. They mm -hmm. seem to help kids learn about these instant transitions that can happen. And um, and moms are maybe more gradual, but dads will do more of the, now we're doing this, bam, switch. Now we're doing yeah, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to yeah. rough house. Now we're done. We're, we're doing yeah, this instead. Yeah. And how that is a hard thing for kids to learn, but this is a skill we all need yeah. where this thing's happening, switch, now this thing's happening. Sometimes we don't have time for that transition, and that is hard, and sometimes that is the case. And so we work to build that skill and how dads bring that to the table. And That's so great. this rough housing reminds me. That's great. That. So so um, now we're going to get into those nine specific ways. And I just want you to know, we're getting this from the book, The Art of Rough Housing, but I'm also accumulating it from other blogs I've read about rough housing and kind of mm -hmm. taking all information together. So it's not necessarily our own unique information. I am kind of just getting all, credit, I'm yeah. synthesizing all that and mm -hmm. then bringing it to to the audience. So number one, the, the first thing that I saw consistent was it rewires the brain, making kids smarter. Ooh. And yeah, and that's cool. <laughs> and there's a quote from a, a biologist named Mark Beckoff, who has a book called Wild Justice. And he says this, there's a quote, the unpredictable nature, kind of like what you were saying of roughhousing, actually rewires a child's brain by increasing the connections between neurons in the cerebral cortex, which in turn contributes to behavioral flexibility. Learning how to cope with sudden changes while roughhousing trains your kiddos to cope with unexpected bumps in the road when they're out in the real world. Well said. Isn't that cool, but a it kind of smoother than yeah, what I was but saying. But yeah, it says exactly. What, it makes them more ready for those unpredictable situations. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I really, when you're roughhousing, it's so unpredictable. You know, yeah. I have no idea which kid's gonna get on the couch and jump on my back, and yeah. or where where a pillow is gonna come flying from to you know get me, or if all three kids are gonna team up against me, yeah. and 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 all those kind of situations. And they don't know. Yeah. They don't know moment to moment. It's, it's changing, and then it's done. Yeah. And then we're done roughhousing yeah. and now it's time for bed or yeah. school or whatever it might be. Yeah. And then able to, to then quickly switch that. So it makes mm -hmm. the kids smarter because it's making those connections um, and those neuron connections and those cerebral cortex to increase their flexibility, the behavior yeah. flexibility. And, to move and just from one moment to the next. Remember our brain, we do things one time and it creates a little tiny pathway of neurons. And then we do it again and it gets a little thicker and a little thicker and a little thicker until we're able to do things well, walking, whatever it might be. It includes this. It's something where we want to build this, we're going to have to keep repeating it so mm -hmm. the brain can build those connections over time. Yeah, that's great. And so number one, it rewires the brain, making your kids smarter. That's a good reason to roughhouse, yes. right? So number two, it teaches children about taking turns and cooperation. Mm -hmm. A skill we all need. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, very important. And what I think it does, what I've what I've seen is, especially, I love doing this with families, Sarah, where maybe kids um, are at odds with each other, where they don't seem to be uh -huh. on the same team. Mm -hmm. I think it, you then you you put them on the same team against you. So yes. if I ever saw uh, Abby and Brennan kind of nitpicking at each other and they seem like they're arguing, I'd be like, you know what? You and I need to go at it. You two against me. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And so it had all of a sudden they would be communicating, be like, you take him from this side. I'll take him from that side. And we're both, or I'll get this pillow and you get him. And so it was really fun to watch them go off and they, they sneak in the kitchen, whisper, 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 and then come back. And they look so confident. Yeah. They finally figured out how to destroy me, how yes. to defeat yeah. me. It builds that cooperation, mm -hmm. that working together with another person towards a shared goal. Well, and he says in the book, he says, physical games require the give and take of negotiation to establish the rules upon which everyone needs to agree in order for all of us to have fun. So really mm -hmm. in that roughhousing, there is a lot of ways in which you're setting some rules, you know, you're, right. you're, you're, and we'll get more into that in just a minute, but there is this sense of what is appropriate, what is inappropriate. Um, roughhousing also requires taking turns with the dominant role. So sometimes maybe one kid is the more dominant one and we're all teaming mm -hmm. up against that one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I know even in the pool at times, Abby's the more dominant ones, or I'm even thinking of games like we just with uh, some relatives came over on July 4th and we played the game of uh, of uh, what chicken, not chicken, but where we're ones on the shoulders. Chicken. Is it? Yeah we're, yeah, we're on the shoulders and we're fighting each other, yeah. right? Yeah. And so stuff like that, how how each of the siblings got to be a more dominant mm -hmm. one there, depending mm -hmm. on who was helping them lift them up. So mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, you just see so much joy and so much fun mm -hmm. happening. Um, and it was just, it was fun for them to get to take part in that because typically they're not the more dominant one. Typically yeah. the adult is, the parent is, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of even fun for them to be the one who's stronger, like you were saying, um, in the holding them. And then they're the one beating me up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so yeah. strong, you know? Well, and, and in mine, you know, when they overpower and yes. get away, mm -hmm. you know, and they laugh and, and I, and I think we have to remember, too, how important it is for kids to have a sense of power, mm -hmm. you know, that builds that self-confidence, that builds that sense of self that I can go into the world and tackle hard things. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. kids learn, learn this in play. So if I can wrestle yeah. and beat you, then I believe it builds that sense of I can go out and tackle other hard things. Yeah and also be successful. Well, I love that when they're really little too, the whole, like you chase them and they're screaming, running from uh -huh. you, and all of a sudden they chase you and you run and scream. Yes. And it's like, you're like, ah, I'm scared yeah. of you. you know, Look at those, the power yes. that they can experience yeah, in yeah. that moment of play. And then of course, you're not running as fast as you can and they catch you. And they're like, yeah. look how fast I am, I got you. you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so number two was it teaches children about taking turns and cooperation. Number three, it toughens kids up. Okay, mm -hmm. so it toughens kids up. Mm -hmm. Why would that be beneficial, Sarah? What do you think? Well, I think kind of what we were just saying, how you want kids to feel like they're strong enough for this moment, mm -hmm. for whatever whatever life brings to them. And we all know life brings hard stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. you feel like you're kind of under the water. And you want this, you want them to go be able to pull from something inside of them that says, I am strong enough. I am tough enough. I have what it takes for this moment. Yep. Yep. I can handle it. And so when it says toughen kids up, that's it's referring to that sense of I can do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it also is referring to I know this happened a lot and I had to learn how to be better at roughhousing because kids are going to get hurt during roughhousing. Right, yeah? right. Sometimes almost well, inevitably. And, and that's it, right? Yeah, I almost can get hurt. And I, I found it was weird. Almost inevitably, Brennan seemed to get hurt more than his sisters did. But I think a lot of times I was actually being rougher on him. You were. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I somehow had this idea with my Gotta daughters. Get my boy to be yeah, strong. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't need to toughen up my daughters. I needed to toughen up my son. So I yeah. felt the freedom to like toss him further yes. or throw him higher. And so then all of a sudden- I like, wish <laughs> I had video to couple with this so you yes. guys could see. We yes. had couches and Brennan would just be launched across the living room. He was <laughs> yes. like three years old. Yeah. Years. And so I think part of me was thinking, I need to toughen my boy up, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it was fun to see how, how he could rebound and he needed to know that. That like, even though yeah. he got hurt there, he got cut or he got bruised, that he was able to come back. So there's and, that physical yeah. side, which translates then even into mm -hmm. the other challenges sure. in life you yeah. know yeah, yeah. They, these minor scrapes and bruises aren't going to knock you yeah. down forever that you can get uh, yeah 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 so the number four number three was it toughens kids up number four it teaches kids to take risks mm -hmm. so he says here sir it's, it, it, rough housing becomes a safe place to make mistakes it's a mm, safe place to learn to be braver and also for them to stand up for themselves yeah i love that
You know, I, I, I like that idea that it's a place where they, they get to go in and they get to really show up and be brave and be mm -hmm. strong and sometimes make a mistake and lose the battle. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's very little, you know, like to risk there, you know, right. um, so it's they're aiming. practicing risk yeah. for the real world. And it's practicing showing up and being strong, yep. you know, yep. and come back. I don't know how many times the kids have decided they finally are stronger than me and they'll be like, okay, let's go get them. <laughs> and, they'll be like, and then I'm able to maybe either say, oh, you did overpower me or go, oh, you think that's as big as I can go? I can go bigger. And mm -hmm. then they'll be like, oh, whoa, I thought we'd reached his max, you know? Yeah. And so, so it was really, especially in the pool, you see their face light up when they think they've got me. And then I throw them across the pool yeah. and they splash and Abby's laughing her head off and like, I didn't know dad could pick me up still, you know? <laughs> And, and, and it also helps them go, hey, dad's getting older, um, but he's still able to do these things, you know? And, and, and it's actually dad's a safe place in this moment to be fully like aggressive like this mm -hmm. and dad can handle it. It's not gonna hurt mm -hmm. him. I love too the mistakes part where maybe they make a plan and it doesn't work out or you overpower, whatever the situation is. I love that we it's so important to learn that i can make up something and i can try it out and even if it goes bust i can come back and come up with a new one i take that information and weave it into my new plan and oh man don't we want that in life or where something doesn't knock us down we just go okay i'm down for a second but i'm gonna make a plan and go back in I like this one guy was talking specifically, like you said, about fathers doing this. And this quote I got from him was this, fathers play a particularly important role in the development of children's openness to the world. They also tend to encourage children to take risk while at the same time ensuring their safety and security, thus permitting children to learn to be braver in unfamiliar situations, as well as to stand up for themselves. Yeah, because so. I got my dad, my, my safety nets mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I can go ahead and try yeah this. it reminds me of kids going on a playground yeah yeah you know where they're climbing that big pole or reaching things they haven't been able to do you know you watch your little kids do that and how you're standing below them like yeah. go ahead yeah. give it a shot i'm right here yeah. you know and i think maybe i resonate with that because i think at times I'm just not as smart as you about what those risks should be. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I remember abby is like a little kid climbing up some playground uh -huh. and then going she's really high. I don't think Sarah would ever <laughs> let her do this. And it was a moment of like, I don't think I should be either, maybe, but I am. It's already happened. But it was like, she saw me climb it. So she said, I can climb it too, you know? Yeah. And so it was really, I, I began to notice the power I had in modeling to her that what I was trying, she wanted to try. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be like, I gotta be careful what I'm showing her. <laughs> so, okay. So, okay, so number four was it teaches kids to take risks. Number five, it helps kids manage aggression. So it doesn't, lots of times parents are afraid when I've recommended this to them, they think it'll make kids more violent and more aggressive. But what the research shows is it doesn't make kids more violent because they learn the difference between healthy roughhousing and aggression. They mm -hmm. learn what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. It's kind of the idea of if I just say, oh, a stove can burn me, so I'm just never going to use the stove. Instead, it's like, oh, no, you can, there's this, you can still approach it and just learn how to use it. So Sometimes there's times I can be rough and I can do this stuff and I learn the boundaries and the parameters of that and, and get to experience that. And it, one study out of Germany said children who roughhouse at home are actually less violent, presumably because they feel a strong connection with their fathers and because they learn the difference between healthy roughhousing and aggression. And it goes on, a psychologist named John Snarry from How Fathers Care for the Next Generation, his book, he says, children who roughhouse with their fathers quickly learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable, you know? Yeah. And so so I, I think that's true. I think that yeah. so many times when, when kids are doing those forms of aggression, I quickly want to say, hey, are you guys roughhousing with this kid? You know, mm -hmm. let's show them how to do this in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. Let's show them how, I mean, many times if a kid is biting or a kid is hitting, I say, man, if that kid starts to come out, you grab a pillow and be like, let's go at it. You know, you want to rough out, let's do this. right? Mm -hmm. And then the kid's like, oh, I was really mad. And I thought the way to communicate that had to be through aggression and violence. But mm -hmm. instead I can communicate that by hitting you with a pillow, you know? Mm -hmm. And we can do that in a way that isn't so harmful to each other. Yeah, yeah. Can we even into a healthy expression instead of just a response? Yeah. It even, even dogs do that. Mm -hmm. Little mm -hmm. puppies at first are too. Yeah. And you'll see the older dogs putting that, you know, telling that dog, uh-uh, mm -hmm. too far, mm -hmm. that bite hurt. 
you know, but you can, because dogs point. actually bite each other when they play, yeah, but somehow yeah, yeah. they've learned, yeah. they've communicated to that younger generation, this is how hard to bite. No, don't bite that hard. You can jump on me, but don't do, you know, you see that with our dog had yeah. to go through that training. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 same idea. <laughs> yeah. So number five was it helps kids manage aggression. So if you have an aggressive kid, this would be a great way to, to help f- fine tune that. Number six is it increases social and emotional intelligence. And the way it does that, Sarah, it talks about how roughhousing requires the child to, to, to learn to get an accurate reading of social cues yeah. when things have gone too far, you know, mm-hmm. like like when it's gone from now, we were having a good time and now we're not, you know, mm-hmm. we were just having fun and playing, but now it looks like there's fear and anger, you know? Mm-hmm. So the ability to to see that, to read that in a sibling or even in a parent or whatever, to, to model that for them, to say, whoa, 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 we need to pause for a moment because it looks like we've gone too far. That's yeah. important for them to learn. Yeah, so good. Again, back to those just healthy boundaries in our behaviors. This one quote I love from a, a play expert. Um, he, he has He's the founder of the National Institute for Play, Dr. Stuart Brown. He said this. He said, the lack of experience with roughhousing hampers the normal give and take necessary for social mastery and has been linked with poor control of violent impulses later in life. When kids roughhouse, they learn to tell the difference between play and actual aggression. Mm-hmm. And I think at times I've even had to learn that. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you said, when Brennan would get hurt, I'd be like, oh, did Took I? Took it too yeah, far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, was I trying to be too strong and show my kids, no, oh, uh, look how strong I am. Maybe uh, I need to pull it back a little bit and read their faces a little bit. And so mm-hmm. I, I I encourage, we'll get into just a minute with some kind of boundaries that you can set, but I think it's important to even have like a light system. You can be like, hey, mm-hmm. red, yellow, green, green as we just go. Mm-hmm. You know, yellow is let's pause and, and take mm-hmm. some caution here because look at their face. So that's such a cool way to teach those social cues is through the rough house. Yeah. You know? yeah. Okay, so number seven, Sarah, is it teaches kids about boundaries, ethics, and morality. Mm-hmm. That's a it's a big thing to teach, it right? Is, and and it I mean is. they they make the contention that it teaches them how to learn the difference between right and wrong and the appropriate use of strength and power. Yeah. So I I I thought I thought this was a really cool thing that he said. He says it teaches them self control, fairness, and empathy, but it also models for them something they're calling self handicap handicapping, mm-hmm. which means the kids learn that actual strength is showing compassion to those weaker than you. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to this idea that my kids know that I'm stronger than them. They know that if I went full force. So many mm-hmm. times I would actually, if you remember, Sarah, when I would do this, when I get on my knees and wrestle with mm-hmm. them, right? I wouldn't stand mm-hmm. up above them. So I try to make myself smaller so they had a better chance, right. you know? Right. So I was self handicapping and showing them that if I wanted to get stronger and bigger, I could, I'm choosing not to mm-hmm. for your benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a, a lesson every we all need, right? There's all times. There's times we need to, uh, we could overpower or hurt someone, and physically, but in other ways too. And we step back, and that's all. That's a skill we need to be able to read that moment and yeah. show up in the in the way. Well, and this one guy I read his last name's Beckoff. He said this is moral behavior because the larger the animal cares more about both players having fun together than it does about winning. Mm -hmm. So the larger animal is saying, hey, I care more about us enjoying this Mm -hmm. than I do about beating you. And so kids learn how that strength is showing compassion. So I just think that's a really cool attribute to have. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It feels like it even could play a role, an important role later in a dating relationship. That's true. That's great. Mm -hmm. So number eight, it makes kids physically active and can protect them from depression. Right. Yeah. So I thought this this was this was a cool study actually from a Norwegian University of Science and Technology where they were saying being active they, they were thinking being active getting sweaty and roughhousing um, could offer more than just physical benefits. So the researcher examined just under 800 children when they were six years old, and they conducted they conducted follow up examinations with about 700 of them when they were eight and 10 years old to see if they could find a correlation between physical activity and symptoms of depression. So they found that the more the kids engaged in activity that caused them to sweat and pant, the less incidence there was of depression. Yeah. Yeah. So so helping yeah. your kids experience that like physical, you mm-hmm. know, going, getting all mm-hmm. sweaty. And I, we definitely would get sweaty mm-hmm. <laughs> when we and the kids, I'd have to turn on the fan. We'd all lay there and just sweat, but I didn't know I was helping them possibly with depression yeah. in the future. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. Cause just like exercise, it releases that stuff in your brain that says all's well, I'm doing well, I'm happy. It reduces stress. It's 
great. So the last one, number nine, Sarah, is roughhousing builds a better bond. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I put down as I was reading this, this one I definitely have experienced above all the other. That I th the rough play f that that fathers engage in. Um, the guy was saying in this one book that the rough play is just as important as the gentle mothering that mothers do. You know, I, I, I think I stumbled upon this because I would see how good you were at being so nurturing and empathetic. And I just thought, man, what is my role? I don't, I, I don't, I try to do what you're doing and sometimes I'm successful, but a lot of times I'm not. But then I found, wait, I, my roughhousing is the way that I'm helping connect with mm -hmm. them. And he was mm -hmm. saying like, like things that we did as kids when they were little was throwing your kid in the air, swinging them upside down. Mm -hmm. He said, these are all important activities that help kids learn that they can trust you and that mm -hmm. you can keep them safe. That, that we can engage in some kind of scary thing. Like that's terrifying to the kid that's yeah, flying in the air. You so can see fun. it on their face, uh, but then you catch them. And I just think that's so powerful that the, the, when you do that and every time you're catching them, of course, if you drop them, that's a big mistake. Yeah, don't, <laughs> that, don't do that. Don't that you're them. doing and you catch them, <laughs> that they go, wow, my parents have me. You yeah. know, they'll keep me safe. Yeah. I can try and risk and do scary things, mm -hmm. but they'll be there. And actually, you know, and, and, and just neurologically, the closeness and the physical activity that you get from the wrestling and also actually releases the hormone oxytocin, which is, you know, the attachment chemical in our brain, and it boosts feelings of bonding and closeness, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the kids, at least I meet, most of them really crave it. Most of them, when I talk to them and say, hey, are your parents doing this? Mm -hmm. Is your dad doing this? They're like, no, but I wish he would do more yeah. of it. Yeah. No, I see the difference in our kids. Mm -hmm. You, I mean... After after you guys have rough, rough house and since they were little to now, it they you just you almost feel like you can see a layer of stress has fallen off of them. Mm -hmm. so you don't mm -hmm. I don't even know that they seem super stressed, but then afterwards there's just this peace and calm, and you can tell how connected they feel to you, yeah. and they're just their well being their is higher after that. Yeah. So so I want to encourage you to get the book, The Art of Rough Housing. Um, Dr. Cohen is one of the co-authors. Um, this will be a great technique to start implementing mom and dad before the school year starts and as mm -hmm. the school year begins. It'd be a mm -hmm. great way to work out this big backpack of feelings that they're definitely going to have preschool, mm -hmm. you know, before they go to school and then after school yeah. begins. Yeah, especially those days you they come home and you just feel like something's a little off or yeah. they're a little quiet or they're a little maybe aggressive, whatever it might look like for your child plan in those sessions. And and again, how, how long do you, does it need to be? No, I'm talking like three minutes. Yeah. yeah. Three to five minutes. Yeah. And I typically, Turn on a couple loud I typically songs. Would, would put a boundary on it. I picked a song I liked uh -huh. and told them, this is how it's going to happen. We're going to just wrestle. We're going to pillow fight. Or we're gonna, and then mm -hmm. we're done. We're going to relax. And then we're going to talk about your day. Right. Yeah. So that could be a cool technique in the morning if helping them prepare for school or afterwards when they get mm -hmm. home. I just think it'd be just really great to start implementing that soon. So that way then yeah. you have that in your, your tool belt with them and they can ask for it if they need it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I hope you found this podcast really helpful today and especially in preparation uh, for your kids going back to school and just so you feel like you can be helpful in making that big transition. So once again, if you like this podcast, please share it, send it to your friends, and uh, we appreciate you listening. Have a great day. The Art of Raising Humans podcast should not be considered or used as counseling, but for educational purposes only. 